Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Corey Pierce, and I'm the Marketing Director at Churn Zero, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar titled, A New Manager's Guide for a Customer Success Strategy Implementation. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that we are recording this session, and a link to the recording will be available 24 hours after this webinar. Throughout the presentation, you are welcome to submit your questions via the question and answer box, and our staff will try and answer them as we go. We will also address as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion of this webinar. Now I'm pleased to introduce to you our presenter for today, Amelia Danzica. Amelia is a customer success and account management growth consultant and partner at Winning by Design. With deep expertise in scaling organizations, she works with companies globally to build programs that are customer-centric and scalable. She's process and cultural driven during building high performance teams. She's based in Silicon Valley and led teams at JobVite, Bright Edge, and WalkMe. She has also held numerous interim head of customer success roles, which makes her a perfect person to be talking to us today about a new manager's guide for CS strategy implementation. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Amelia. Corey, thanks so much for having me today. And um, I just want to turn on my camera quickly and say hi to everyone. Um, I know there's there's a big group here, but I just wanted to say hi and uh, really excited to be part of this today. So cameras are distracting, I'll turn them off now. But um, hopefully everyone can see my screen now. And I thought I'd start with this quote and ask the audience, how many years have you been in a management role? Maybe you can just put it in the chat box. Um, there is a, a place for you down here for you to put in the chat. If you can let me know, let the others know how long have you been um, in a management role? So I'll just give the, the audience a moment to put some answers in here. Okay, great. Well, what I'm going to do today is share my journey. Uh, I've been in management for eight years of my career. I've been in tech for, for 20 and uh, giving away my age here. And I didn't really want to be in management until I was 35. I finally felt confident enough to be able to say, you know what, I think I can do this. I want to mentor and coach people and I want to lead teams. And I've been watching people do it for a long time and I've been learning from them and now I'm ready to do it. Um, so one thing that was really important for me was to get over this fear factor. Well, I've never been a manager before, how can I do it? And when a few years after that, I really realized I loved management and I went on to get an MBA. Um, that was my goal, get an MBA before I was 40. Uh, I did it, and uh, it further helped me get over this fear factor of can I be a positive leader? And so today what I really want to talk about is, well, I'll share with you three different frameworks that I've used in my career to lead teams, and, process, and then I'll, I'll really focus on one that is simple that anyone can adopt. And it really starts with the people element. And then I'll dive deeper into process and finish off with technology. So uh, first, of course, you have to select a framework before you get started. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes I see managers make is they start putting all this process in place, all of these changes they're making but there's really no rhyme or reason behind it. So if you have a framework that you can work with, it really helps frame your thinking and it helps your team and your leaders understand what are you doing. So one that I've used um, over and over again is the Salesforce, uh, what Mark Benioff claims or, or shares. He wrote this on a napkin when he started Salesforce and he started with what's my vision and what values do I want to hold myself accountable to and my colleagues? And what methods am I going to use for success? 
uh, what obstacles do I currently have and what obstacles am I foreseeing? And then of course, how will I measure success? And every quarter Salesforce uh, not only builds these V2 moms for each team or the team leaders build them, but then they go and um, do it on a yearly cadence as well. And I found that that framework has worked really well. The one I'm going to share with you today uh, because of time, and I think it's a really simple, great framework to use as people process technology. And then there's one more, which I'm actually working with a client with right now and when i shared the different frameworks they said you know what this is what will resonate most with our team and that's a one-page strategic plan so putting being able to do put together a big brainstorm with your team and then breaking it down to one page of what challenges are we facing what are the results we want to achieve what enablers do we have what do we need to start to be able to enable success and then breaking it down into plans so um, being able to synthesize each quarter each year into these simple frameworks will really help you uh, as a leader in customer success so the first let's talk about people one of my favorite uh, pieces of of being in a management position and it really starts with you. So looking at yourself as a leader, and I'm in a position where I get to work with so many great leaders, and what I find that the most successful leaders out there that they hold is a positive attitude. And that, that's in the way they lead their team, in their tone, in their communication style written as well. And that kind of positive attitude is infectious. So if you come to work with that, with more of a negative stern tone, it really impacts the team. I see this over and over again. Um, and so being able to have that growth mindset, finding those mentors and coaches out there that are willing to give you the, the feedback you need to be able to grow is really important uh, when you're building a team, looking at yourself and being in this mindset of one, not only being positive, but two, how can I continuously grow? Next, your team. The most successful teams I've seen built are ones that have di a lot of diversity because guess what? Your customers are all different. You have different personas, different buyers, and if you, keep hiring people like yourself, then you're not going to be able to represent your customers. And what I love to do is hire people that are smarter than me, that have something that I know I don't have as a forte and make sure that I cover that with um, people on the team that have that, that special gift or education at Winning by Design, we believe that every single person on a team has a freebie or something they're really good at, whether it's uh, being metrics driven and really understanding numbers or understanding uh, emotional intelligence of customers. Those kind of things are incredibly important when you think about building a team. So I encourage all of you to get out of your comfort zone and hire people that are different than you. Always think about continuous excellence for the team. When I'm building playbooks for companies and I ask them, what is it that you'd really, um, when I ask the teams, what is it that you feel is missing? A lot of the employees tell me, you know, I wish I had more training. It doesn't ne even necessarily need to be formal, but I wish we had more training during our meetings instead of being told what to do. Not only will training help employees feel more engagement, but they'll feel more empowered. And that's really, really important. Your customers will experience, uh, will, will feel like they're in better hands of a leader, of a customer success manager, if those employees know what they're doing and that they are be, being able to provide their customers what customers really need. 
and that means empowering them. And then last but not least, uh, employee evangelism. If your employees feel like they're providing excellence in their roles and they really understand what they're doing, then the employee evangelism is a natural result. So next, the people element, your boss. I would encourage you to stop thinking about this person as your boss, but rather, but rather as your sponsor. Um, in one of my roles when I first started, I had three people that I was reporting to. And as you can imagine, three founders, three different viewpoints, uh, constantly different feedback on my work. It was really challenging. One day I had to sit them down and say, you know what? You are sponsoring my success and the team's success and the customer success. I want you to become aligned on what does success mean? Let's do it together. And so if you're able to, to shift your mindset on how you view the person you, you report to, to one that says you are sponsoring me to be successful, suddenly your conversations change. So this is really important. Um, last but not least is communication with your company. Being able to put your customers uh, your your company at the forefront when you think about what are you building and then communicating it with them. So for example, um, putting, uh, this is an example from Drift. They have every single person rotate into a support function. So all the engineers, for example, they are expected to, to do support work so that they really understand the voice of the customer. So think about how can you get your company more involved in customer success and really understanding the voice of the customer. This is this is um, really a really powerful way I've found to even shift how companies view their relationship with customers. So next, I want to talk about process. Um, we have different kinds of customers. Some companies, for example, if you think of Slack, at the most basic level, it's gone viral, and it's really a self-service product in many ways. It's so easy to, to um, use. So when you think about growing your team and scaling, think about is your product even ready for a self-service experience? And if it's not, think about what are the gaps and how do I work with product to be able to make it self-serve before you sign up for that type of customer journey. Uh, for low touch, this is really important and um, something that you need to be thinking about, especially if your company is focused on startups and SMB companies where they may be paying a low um, uh, monthly reoccurring revenue they can't possibly have that high touch experience where you have calls with them on a regular cadence and your customer success managers are seen more as partners working with the customers for success. Whereas self-service and low touch, you may never even talk to a customer success manager um, often until it's around nine month nine or 10 when it's time for you know, a discussion around uh, renewals. So I, I just wanted to bring this up as well. People always ask me, well, how much uh, quota should a CSM be carrying? And there are books out there that will tell you, uh, I've read them, I've read them all around, you know, 1.5 to 2.5 million dollars. I think that's a made up ratio. I, I haven't seen the science behind it. And every single company is different. So depending on your company's maturity level, is it truly a self-service, uh, for example, or is it a high touch? And then some, some customers are paying $5 million a year, and then others are paying um, 18,000 a year, for example. So to be to to assume that there's some ratio of how much a CSM 
can handle is really, I think, made up. And I encourage you to think about your own company and where are you in the maturity level and how much can a customer success manager truly handle when it comes to what are they expected to do? For example, are they expected to do the renewals and expansion? Then if so, you're probably going to have to lower the number because they're going to have so many more hats to wear. Um, your real impact as an organization and as a leader is to be continuously driving growth and value for the customer while leveraging technology to scale. And there's so many different people that you're working with at the forefront. It's your customers and then your team, your customer marketing team, if you have one. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later again. And then of course, your executive sponsorship. So your customer journey has really changed with the introduction of SaaS and no longer is marketing and sales responsible for the profit. And more and more customer success is seen as the pr true profit center. And it's if you think about it, you may bring in a customer for $18,000 and they may sign up for two years, but then what happens at year three and year four? That's really when you're, experiencing true expansion and impact from those customers' journey. The, the, I love thinking about the uh, Uber and Lyft model, that, or even Amazon, that first uh, $20 you spend with these companies to try it out is just the beginning. And then think about how many times over and over have you uh, used these products and services that's where these companies are truly growing. And it's from that reoccurring revenue, being happy with their experience with your teams. I love this quote. I wanted to share it because so many people think that they're providing superior experience to their customers. But then when you go and interview customers, the, the number is actually quite different. And um, I work with a lot of companies. They ask me to go interview customers. Uh, I do NPS scoring. And what the, cust the company thinks how they're doing is often dramatically different. So this is probably the best stat um, I was able to find out there to really exemplify what, what I've experienced recently working with, with companies. So how do you create this experience where you, you think you have an amazing experience for your customers, but then you go and survey them and that's not actually the case. And it's a lot of questioning and it starts with, how does a customer even get started with my product? Putting yourself in your customer's shoes. How will they learn how to use the product? You've used your product a thousand times. Think about them using it for the first. How do they gain impact? So I, I know the big buzzword in customer success is value, but I encourage you to take it a step further and think about impact. And there's a, there is a difference. When you think about impact, you think about impacting your customer's business because that is what they're worried about. I'm spending X amount of dollars with this product and service. How is it going to impact my business? Is it going to help me uh, reduce my own churn? Is it going to help me increase profits? Is it going to help my employees become more, um, become more efficient, for example? And then of course, what happens when something goes wrong? And all too often when I, I join companies as um, an interim head or I, I, I'm building these playbooks, it's often a fire hose. There's something goes wrong, um, there's support maybe, or the support is the CSM. So being able to map out what happens when something goes wrong is incredibly uh, powerful. This is an example of a customer journey. I absolutely love it. One of my 
Friends is the chief customer officer at Leadspace, and um, she lets me use it. But you can see here that this is a proactive customer journey. And then down here is a reactive customer journey. And so being able to break down your customer's journey into four simple steps, for example, onboarding, adopting, growing, and renewing, and then what can happen in a proactive experience versus a reactive can be really powerful for not only for you as you think about your building of the customer journey, but for your team, how they understand the customer's journey. Because not enough companies are building these type of experiences for their customers. So this is an example of an onboarding journey. It's a blueprint. Um, this is a winning by design standard blueprint. We give all of our blueprints away on Lucidchart. Uh, you don't even need a, um, a paid account, they're free. And we have many different journeys that you can start with um, as a beginning point for your own customer journey. And once you start using Lucidchart, uh, it's actually quite addictive, and it's a great way to visualize what is happening in your customer's journey and where does a customer success manager fit into it. All right, so um, I just happened to select the onboarding one, but we have many others for you to leverage. How else can you build these type of customer journeys? Well, it's li using listening tools. Um, I know there's so many debates about NPS. Some people hate them, some people love them. But what I can tell you is when I've used NPS scores and worked closely with CEOs, it's been amazing how I've been able to get budget and to get alignment across executives when they're telling me nothing's wrong with the customer experience but they're losing customers and the NPS is below zero. It's actually shocking to a, to a company to see um, not only NPS, but I typically build these with about nine other questions. And that's where the real value of, of sending an NPS uh, survey goes out. A CSAT after a support experience, as well, a great opportunity to understand your customers. Um, if you're not sending post onboarding surveys out, please consider it. It doesn't have to be long. In fact, I hate long surveys. I send five, five questions because I believe that the onboarding is the beginning of churn. And if you send out surveys, you're really able to understand um, did they actually get what they were sold? And if not, we need to help them. And uh, your CSM is an incredibly important source. They're, they are talking to the customers. They can hear the tone changes in the customers' voices. And they can, they can see the difference in usage uh, when they're working with customers on projects. So these are some of the listening tools there are many, many others having branded online communities. I've built them. Um, they're great opportunities for not only customers to share ideas, but also to learn from one another. Third party review sites. I, I use them all the time when I'm working with customers. I go there and I read what are customers saying about this client? Uh, and I pull out the good and the bad and the ugly and um, build a story around it. And sometimes I reach out to them if they share their information. Social media, another great one, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, your customers are writing about you and their experience with you. Events, another great way. I love hosting lunches, always round tables, uh, making sure that a team member's there and customers so they can get to hear each other's stories and then you can learn from them and how they're leveraging your product. And then back channel. Um, I can't tell you how many times people reach out to me and say, 
I know you're using the following product or you've tweeted about it or you've, um, you've written about it. Can you share a little bit more? So when I say back channel, I mean doing research and then contacting someone, for example, on LinkedIn or sending them an email. Next, growth strategy. Uh, I love this quote from Tomas Tungs, probably saying his name uh, wrong. If you don't get his weekly emails, I highly recommend you sign up for them. But um, as customer success leaders, this quote should make you feel really good because customer success will exceed new bookings from, um, from um, the sales team. So uh, this year, if any of you attended Saster, the, the CEO of Ring Central said that 40% of revenue, they're nearing a billion dollars for this year, will come from current customers. And while it's not exceeding, it is going in the right direction. And I found that number um, quite, quite exceptional to hear. For key performance indicators, people ask me about this all the time. It really depends on the product, but um, of course, adoption. Are your customers adopting the product? And people try to, um, get their customers to adopt everything at once. I don't believe in that. I believe in onboarding to give customers what they signed up for and what they have their, as their biggest pain points. Help them adopt the product to alleviate those pain points first and then worry about uh, further adoption throughout the rest of the year and your engagement with them. So these are just some of the ways, logins, usage, uh, by number of employees, number of products they're adopting throughout the journey. Um, CS engagement, are they missing meetings? Are they asking for meetings? Um, are they attending webinars and events? And then are they asking questions with support? When they're not, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, even attending um, events, for example, or filling in NPS, surveys, CSAT, I would be most worried about the ones that don't answer anything or engage at all. So I've talked a lot about um, leads coming in and then your role is expanding the revenue. And, you know, there, I love this quote, there are two causes of churn um, and the, they occur more frequently than others. The loss of the champion is definitely one. And then the failure to successfully onboard the customer. I listen to a lot of call recordings for companies. And during onboarding, the CSM is so concerned about getting through a deck and not listening to what the customer needs during the onboarding. And one I listened to yesterday, there was so much friction on the call that the customer, I felt at the end, just left not being heard and instead being forced to, to uh, sitting through a deck. And that's not what onboarding is about. So onboarding is about really understanding what did the customer sign up for? What are their biggest pain points? And working on that before they, they, they worry about getting through a presentation, for example. Um, Joey Coleman, he's another great CX professional. He wrote, a book about the first 100 days, highly recommend it. And this was one of my favorite quotes from his book, without a successful onboarding program, you'll lose 20 to 70% of your customers within the first 100 days. And people don't believe me, but then when we go look at the conversion rates from customer commits to customer goes live with impact, it's actually a big number that actually doesn't convert to live. So um, these numbers are, are not, are, are, are absolutely credible. How do you make a great onboarding? One, you break it down for your customer. This is an example of an onboarding guide. Uh, I broke down a customer journey, which I, from the, I heard from the customers felt complex. I broke it down into three steps with What's the effort 
who's responsible for it and what kind of time frame. So really breaking down the critical events for implementation, what is the customer responsible for, and what are you as a company responsible for? So being really committed to, to giving at least a visual from day one will really help the customer not only understand what's going on, but will help your CSM team ask this very important question. Customer, what happens if you miss this deadline? You've told me you want to be live in 30 days, but if you don't get me the following information, what happens? So being able to have those tough conversations is much easier when you've laid it out for them with exactly who's responsible for what. Now, of course, this can turn into a big project plan, but at the beginning, you just want to at least visualize for them what are the steps to success. So next, let's talk about the growth formula. Your customers are live. Um, monthly reoccurring revenue times churn times upsell. That's really important, um, this growth formula. And there are four opportunities for growth. So the first that most CSMs are used to, you may bring in an account manager, it's the same buyer from a year ago who is purchasing the same product. That maybe your company only has one product right now um, and they, or maybe they're not ready to buy more products. The next one is upsell. So you've rolled out a new product, um, you have more features, they want more usage, additional seats, and maybe a longer contract. So suddenly there's more growth opportunity to upsell. And uh, this is to potentially a the same buyer, of course, and then there are new features. So that's considered an upsell. Uh, this is, by the way, something I highly encourage you to walk your CSMs through. I've, I've held many workshops around this and it's always helpful to visualize this with your team. So um, the next one is the, you have a new buyer in the organization and you have, for example, you unseat a competitor in a new department. Maybe they want more languages or maybe there's a new product launch. So that's really another opportunity. And then the one where I see sales often coming back into your champion leagues, right? That's one of the main reasons um, there's churn at a lot of clients I work with. And so how do you set up um, a, a, a factors or ways of flags, excuse me, to help your CSMs identify the champions gone? One, when, you're, when your CSMs are working with customers, get them to connect on LinkedIn. Um, it's a very quick way to know if someone's leaving a company. And then, of course, pulling in maybe your sales team. You have to essentially resell your product to show the impact you're currently having. So that's often turns into a big executive review um, and often the most difficult, the resell. All right. So improving your, your customer experience through business methodologies and being proactive is incredibly important. We'll talk more about this in the technology piece, but if you're able to improve uh, just a 5% increase in your retention, then you can expect 25 to 75% increase in profit, and that's over five years. Uh, the best way to do that is looking at your customer journey and making small, improvements across the entire journey. That, that's always where I encourage leaders to start. So that leads me to technology. How do you become proactive? Um, there's so many different metrics to measure. It can be really overwhelming when you're trying to measure success. Many companies have CRMs, but for some reason they only put sales in. And then CSMs are working off spreadsheets. Um, luckily, there are CSM platforms out there, and so you're able to track all of these type of things in there. And it's a great way to think about 
how are you going, you may have 10 customers now, but how are you going to service 100 or 1,000? And being able to be proactive by putting technology in place to help your CSMs manage your customers, see trigger points, look at usage and adoption will help them scale much faster. Uh, technology will also help you predict churn and contraction and being able to automate, for example, your flags for your customers. And then it enables uh, you to manage your customers and your team. So having that, that, that overview of what is happening across all of my customers and my team is incredibly powerful. Instead of trying to put together a bunch of spreadsheets and make sense of them. Um, how do you select a prep platform? I always ask customers, well, have you thought about a budget? And then write down all your requirements. Many clients I work with, they go into these conversations without thinking about what are the absolute must-haves and then what are the nice-to-haves because those are very different. Um, the, the, one of the reasons I see failure in launching and adopt, adopting customer success platforms, they don't think about how will they manage long-term success. So being able to either identify someone on the team who, has, uh, who is good with technology and can, I, can manage a platform or hiring an, uh, an operations leader someone who can manage all of the customer success technology. Um, how will you measure customer health? Those are questions that you have to ask yourself and your team. And how will you get that data? How will you use it? So it's great if you have the data, but if you're not using it, then suddenly you're wasting your valuable budget and you're not enabling your team to be successful. So I want to just pause and put all the essentials together. One, select a framework to build your strategy. Break it down by quarter. Monitor it daily with a customer success platform. Um, that's really the best way to have a handle of what is happening, having a pulse on your team, your customers. And then evaluating success and opportunities on a monthly cadence. Too often people just keep going, worrying about the renewals and expansion, but not taking a moment to look at what's broken, what, what in our foundation is broken. And then quarterly, at least quarterly, um, looking at what needs to change for, for next quarter. Yes, celebrate your wins, but also think about what needs to change for next quarter. What can we improve? So if I can leave you with one idea from today is what is one action from today's um, overview that I've given that you can take to move to a growth mindset. And that often means being uncomfortable um, for not only your team, but for yourself. And that's really the first step towards being a successful leader because frameworks are only uh, only work when the whole company holds us, it, themselves accountable to a shared vision, but also that you're actually spending time adhering to what did everyone agree to in that framework. So I encourage you all to create your own growth mindset um, in your journey as a customer success leader. And I'd love to take any questions that you may have. Awesome. Thank you, Amelia, for that presentation. And I love that you challenge us all to uh, start thinking in a growth mindset um, as we might be a new manager or, you know, trying to continue our team success. I love that. Um, so at this time, I would like to invite the audience to please go ahead and submit any questions that you might have uh, via the question and answer box on your webinar console. And we will get to as many as we can. Um, and we have some that have come in. Let me see. 
Um, they're well, they're coming in. Okay. So the first one we have is what are your thoughts on CS operations role um, to help team efficiencies, processes, adoption, accountability, etc. I can't tell you how important uh, a customer operations role is. I believe there are four pillars in customer success, onboarding, ongoing and growth is a, a, the second one. Um, support is the third and then operations is the fourth. I mean, think about it. You have sales teams and they all have operations team. Can you imagine a sales manager setting up your sales force? That would be a disaster. You want to have a customer success operations team. Why are we expecting CSMs to wear so many hats, yet we don't expect our sales teams to? That's a double standard. So I absolutely am a huge advocate of operations for customer success. They are the enablers of success for your team. Great questions, thank you. Awesome. Um, our next question is, um, quickly would you build up a customer success team from one person to many? How would you do it? How, how quickly? Like, oh, how, how quickly? Oh, it all, it all depends on your company's growth. Uh, I'll just use one company that I worked with. When I joined, there were maybe six of us. And in one year, we grew to 35 because we had tripled our numbers. We went from 300 to 1,000 customers in one year. I had to keep hiring. I had to build that operations team. It really depends on... Uh, your forecasting. You have to work closely with your sales ops to forecast and build. That makes sense. We have a question that came in um, that says, hi, we have a non-existent CS program and I am building it out. How do we contact existing accounts who have never had a customer success manager and have been using the tool for six plus months? I, I would do it the old fashioned way with a phone call. I, I, I believe the human element is critical. Feel free to start with a, um, an email request and tell them why. Of course, everyone wants to know why. And then tell them how much time are they expected to give you. I can't imagine customers not wanting to talk to the, their CSM. I, I've left vendors because I, I never heard from them. I'm like, this is a terrible experience. I, I want to engage more with the CSM and they're not willing. So I, I encourage you to do it, get started, don't wait. Good advice. Um, our next question is, what are some, what's some low hanging fruit you recommend focusing on first coming in and how do you go about finding that low hanging fruit? Oh, that's a great question. I, so at Winning by Design, we believe that across the customer journey, there are seven key moments. And I'm just going to that customer journey. Um, and if you, right here, so there's seven key moments. If you improve 10% across those seven key moments, then you'll double your impact. Because if you try to change everything at once, the chances are you won't change anything. Um, but if you ch have incremental change, uh, that can be have the highest impact. So for, let's just use onboarding. If you think of onboarding and customers are taking too long, go to find out, ask customers, and look at internally as well, why is it taking so long? Maybe, maybe you need more help from professional services to help the customer. Is that a service you can offer customers? I'm not saying give it away for free, but what is one thing that is really blocking the success of onboarding? And then from there, just focus on that one thing, get it right, and then move on to the next. Awesome. Our next question is, what top goals do you think it's critical to measure and measure progress against? 
well, I mean, churn and contraction is one of the most obvious ones, especially if your company's trying to raise money, uh, go public. I think that that's what investors are looking at. So being able to measure that is incredibly important. Of course, adoption of a product is another one that's really important. Um, in engagement. I think if your customers are not engaging, uh, I think that's a problem. And then I know someone asked me, what's a CSAT? It's your customer satisfaction score. So looking at, it's amazing what customers are willing to tell you in surveys that they're not willing to tell your CSMs. Don't be afraid to ask your customers questions. I, I believe that they welcome it as long as you don't overwhelm them with too many. Awesome. Yeah, I think those are great things to be measuring. Um, we have a question that came in and says, how do you know when it's time to get a customer success software platform? Oh, that's a good question. Usually companies have uh, that I've worked with get it when it's too late, when <laughs> they've tried to hack a CRM to death to turn it into a CSM platform. Um, they are working off spreadsheets. The manager is absolutely wasting hours and hours every Friday trying to make sense of what happened that week and the numbers. Um, I mean, that's just too late. The the moment you can, you have an operations person, someone who can manage it, is when you should start thinking about it. I mean, I would I've worked with companies who have. 100 customers, but those customers are, are high value customers. They're spending a lot of money and that's been too late for them because they just weren't able to manage these customers well. So I think it really depends to uh, on the company and where you are in your maturity, but it's better sooner rather than later to get a pulse on your customers. That's great. I, we definitely agree. It's you definitely don't want to be behind the curve in that, and then struggling to implement your strategies. Um, we have another question that says, "How do you encourage consistency across your customer success team?" Oh, I love that question. I believe that the best leaders are coaches. They shift that mind frame from um, a manager to a coach. And coaches have regular meetings with their teams. I'm not talking an hour long, boring meeting. I'm talking daily standups of 15 minutes of where are you struggling? Uh, what do you plan to accomplish today? You know, those kind of quick meetings, that agile type of thinking will really help your team. In those 15 minutes, you can do role plays. Someone has a very difficult uh, renewal coming up. They're super nervous. Great, let's all role play. Who's the customer? Who's the CSM? Uh, what are the challenges? Let's go. It takes two minutes to role play and suddenly your CSMs feel empowered. And so setting up a regular cadence and sticking to it can be so powerful. It can be every day at from 12 to 12.15 before everyone sits down to eat together, let's do a role play, let's meet. Um, that is how you will get your team all aligned speaking the same language. Love it. Uh, we have another question that came in that said, I'm curious if you think a CSM should or should not be a revenue quota carrying role. I, I do believe it should be. Um, I know there's so much controversy around this question, but I have worked with teams who have no bonus. Uh, it's just a straight flat salary. And then there's been a change to bonus and um, uh, base. And suddenly the, the results are very different. So having a, a number, a target, hold, makes people more accountable. Uh, people become more hungry, they become more collaborative, they are willing to ask for help more often, and they, they show up with a 
let's do this attitude. It's very different. So I'm a huge advocate of tying a number to CS. That's great. Yeah, we, we agree with you at Turn Zero on that front. Um, we have another question that says, what are your recommendations for reporting on CS teams activities to your leadership team? So, so uh, say that one more time about the recording, I'm sorry. Um, reporting on your customer success team's activities to your leadership team. What recommendations do you have oh, there? I mean, a CS platform can do all of that, right? You can see your what's happening, but you have a, a bird's eye view of customer contact, what's being discussed. If you use a product like Chorus, which I'm a huge advocate of, you are recording all of your customer calls. They're great opportunities, not to make your CSM feel bad, but they're coaching opportunities, being able to add a snippet and being able to say, for example, to your leadership team, being able to play a snippet of it and say, these are the kind of conversations we're having with customers and here's a big highlight let's celebrate this um or here's what our customers really need in the product so i i think it's really important it uh humanizes customer success it's not just constantly a number awesome um our next question is what do you think about success teams that are involved or own the pre-sales process through onboarding and account management? It really depends on the maturity of the company. So I've, I've been in all of those roles where I owned everything. And at a certain point, it's completely overwhelming um, and you have to break up the teams. The mm. other thing is salespeople get so much training on having these sales conversations, these account management, Trainings, if you're not training your CSMs to have those conversations, you're setting your team up for failure. You wouldn't ask your salespeople to be a CSM. Why would you ask your CSMs to be a salesperson? So if you want them to do those roles, get them training. Um, we we offer training. There's that the, we have a winning by design YouTube channel with free training. I mean, there's there's no excuse to, to ask your CSMs to be doing things and not enabling them for success. That's a good recommendation. Um, our next question is, any tips for protecting or shielding your customer success team from tough customers or difficult teams? Uh, the the best way to shield them is to enable them to have difficult conversations. And that means one, education and training, and two, uh, role playing, being prepared for that. Um, I, I, if, if you're not prepared to work with difficult customers, maybe being in CS isn't the right role for you because they're, being a CSM is uh, being in a role where you you will inevitably at some point have a difficult conversation. And that means being able to listen and understand what is the customer concern? How do we disarm this customer? How do we diagnose the true issue? And then how do we describe success moving forward? So being able to do those three Ds, we call them the three Ds at Winning by Design. So being able to disarm, diagnose the situation, and then describe success mm -hmm. is part of the job. You can't shield your team, but you can enable them to have them. I love that. Um, we have, we'll ask one more question. Um, and that is, what traits do you recommend looking for when you're building out a team of customer success managers? I, I love hiring hungry people. So people who are really willing to learn, get out of their comfort. Um, I see look past the resume. You can go to the best school and have a really bad attitude. So, so hiring on attitude, willingness to learn, 
their communication skills in both written and presentation. Definitely ask your during your hiring process for the CSM to come prepared to present to you. Um, it doesn't have to be a big long presentation, but think about how will they be representing your brand. And they have to exude confidence. Uh, when I think about a CSM, I think about a leader because that's their role. They're leading a partnership with your customers. That's what you want to be hiring a leader. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering all those great questions from our audience and going through the presentation and challenging us to have a growth mindset as we go into 2020 um, and uh, enable our customer success teams. Um, so, so thanks so much, Amelia, and thank you to everyone who joined. Um, I just wanted to remind you again that a recording of this webinar will be sent out tomorrow. Um, and at the end of this webcast, you'll see a survey pop up and we'd appreciate it if you could just take a minute before logging off to complete that survey to provide your feedback. Um, we'd love to get that. And so we continue to um, improve our webinar programming. So thanks again for joining us and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.